Welcome in. It is Big Ten Today. It is presented by Gatorade. Great to have you with us on this Thursday. Dave Reps and Rick Pizzo, Jake Butt, halfway point of the season. It's uh, hard to believe, but definitely gives us some perspective, guys. And some expected. Ohio State and Oregon still at the top of the league after the Ducks got the better of the Bucks this past Saturday. But also some pleasant surprises, and we will see one or two of those surprises really this weekend in Bloomington with Indiana and Nebraska. What a fun stretch it's been, too. I mean, each week we're having games come down to the wire. Each week it seems like the bar continues to get raised, and Probably have another good weekend once again. Good good matchups. No doubt. Last week was fabulous. As good yes. as it gets. Yeah, I mean, we hyped up two games, and they lived up to it, and then you had some that you didn't see coming, like uh, Illinois-Purdue, for a instance. Of overtime yeah. matchups. Into a classic. Wisconsin, yeah, was, Wisconsin dominated Rutgers, too. Absolutely. I mean, that yeah. was crazy. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a fun week. Let's get to our big story, and it is the Big Ten standings. Everyone has played three or four games. Remember, nine-game conference schedule Indiana, Oregon, Penn State, the only unbeatens in Big Ten play. They're all unbeaten overall as well. Six teams with one loss in the league, including Ohio State and Michigan teams that are both ranked. The bottom half of the conference, all with at least two losses. Maryland, Purdue, UCLA still in search of their first Big Ten win. Standings are one thing you say, but which team is actually the best one in the conference? Devoted students of our show might recall we went through this exercise two weeks into the season. Jake broke them into tiers. He had Ohio State alone at the top. He had five teams in Tier 2, USC, Penn State, Oregon, Nebraska, and Michigan, and then four more in Tier 3. But as we have mentioned, Jake, we have more data now. And so it becomes maybe an easier exercise, certainly a more educated Mm -hmm. exercise. So Tier 1 was just Ohio State before. I'm going to venture a guess that it's not just Ohio State at this point, are they still Tier 1, or have they separated out of there? Yes, that, oh, it's Ohio State and Oregon are Tier 1, and then, then we go down to Tier 2 for Penn State. But, but last weekend was revealing for a number of reasons. And, I, in fact, we'll talk about Ohio State in a second. My opinion of the Buckeyes hasn't changed. You know, they, they, that was a good game between two opponents, and Ohio State just slightly got uh, beat out by Oregon. But, I, my goodness, that game... Dylan Gabriel was freaking phenomenal. Tez Johnson, Evan Stewart, they were unstoppable, right? The offensive line was was stout up front. I start to look at what what makes Oregon special and and why they were able to win that game and why I have them as the top team in the conference. They answered the questions in the trenches. That's the first part. When we looked at them struggling earlier in the season, I was wondering, you know, how are they going to block Ohio State? How are they going to block some of the better defensive lines in the conference? Not a single sack on the day. Average five yards per carry on the ground, 155 yards total, which is nearly double of the rushing yards that Ohio State had been allowing on the season. And, of course, part of the the theme here at the top of the conference is quarterback play. Dylan Gabriel is the best quarterback and proved it once again why he's the best quarterback in the conference. But the, the last thing I'll say here is the mentality, right? What you learn in those games is the mentality and the cohesion of a team. They didn't blink in the biggest moments. They were prepared, third down, fourth down, some of the play calls, the tackling. Judkins didn't have a single uh, forced missed tackle on the day. He was one of the best in college football going into that. So Oregon is a complete team, and they just they picked the perfect week against the Buckeyes to play their best game of the season. They were also prepared to throw 12 men on the field and say what you will about the controversy regarding that and the NCAA already changing the rule. Dan Lanning's a big game coach. He is a young coach. He has already showed that he is a big game coach. Of course, it was inside Autzen, which I think makes a huge difference if these teams were to meet again this season. The most likely spot before you get to the playoff would be Indianapolis on a neutral site for the Big Ten Championship game. That wouldn't surprise me at all, and I know it wouldn't surprise you because even in the loss, you believe that Will Howard showed you that he is a championship-level quarterback for the other team in Tier 1, Ohio State. Absolutely. That was one of my biggest takeaways. And we, we talk about the, the last play, the decision to scramble. Let's just put that to the side. When you look at his statistics, again, against a great Oregon defense, that dude showed to me that that performance confirms that Ohio State can win a conference title and they can win a national title. That was the best performance by a Buckeye quarterback since C.J. Stroud in terms of big games. But – I think when I look at this, when you talk about tier talk, obviously Ohio State is going to be in everyone's tier one, but it's about something more than that, right? It's a, they're trying to answer a question. Can they win titles, conference titles, national titles? And 
If not, why? Like, why did they fall short last week? And I look at a, a few things. First off, it comes down to running the football. Okay, in the second half, let's take that last scramble by Will Howard out. In the second half then, statistically, they had 11 carries for 7 yards. That's, that's not championship level, right? And, and when you look at the backfield and how good their offensive line had been playing up until that point, that's not going to cut it. Now, we also have the fact they lost their left tackle, Josh Simmons, likely for a season. That, that is a huge, huge loss. And then to come all, all the way home, the, the defense in the biggest moments, because Ohio State has dominated everybody. But why have they fallen short versus Oregon, versus Michigan in 2022, and tw Michigan in 2023, and then versus Georgia? In the fourth quarter of those four games, they have not forced one single punt. Why? They, they, that that D-line is one of the best defensive lines in college football. The secondary is lead. Again, it's not a talent thing. It's not a resource thing. Why? That's the question the Buckeyes have to answer if they want to That's not just be in tier one. That, there, right? it, it is, but let me throw it back at you and ask you why. I mean, is, is it scheme? What's going on here? Like, there was, it's certainly it's not talent, yeah. clearly, right? So uh, what is it? They generally – Ohio State – as a team, played well in this game. They played well versus Michigan in 2022 and 23. They played good, ver you know, they played well versus Georgia. But in all of those games, the common theme was five to six, seven, eight plays that made the difference. There, we talk about one of the big touchdowns that Dylan Gabriel threw on an explosive. Ohio State rushes three. How is there one-on-one -on -one coverage on the outside? I think that was a busted coverage there. If you're going to drop eight in coverage, you should have safeties over the top. You go back to 2022 versus Michigan. Donovan Edwards' big game. He had three explosive touch. Ohio Michigan had a few explosive plays that decided it. So it's they're 95% there, which is still an A when you talk about school. But that 5% has proven to be the killers for the Buckeyes. And, you know, that's why I think Ryan Day decided to give up play calling this year was to start to, you know, interact with the team as a whole to chase those margins. This, this is what makes football so great. It's a game of inches. They've just been on the wrong side of those margins. You know, there's no easy answer to your question, but the criticism out there, certainly from Ohio State fans, is that in all those games, the Buckeyes, whether it's the players or the coaching staff, has picked the wrong time to get tight, right? And, and, and I, whether it's nervousness, whether it's the other team being really good and playing well in critical moments, I do think it's a fair question to ask at this point in the biggest moments, yeah. can the best players step up? I think it's also fair to point out what you said when you were talking about Dan Lanning in Oregon. Like, we're essentially looking at an Ohio State team that was one play away yes. Yes. from having a chance to win the game. And that play... In Eugene. In, the, in Eugene. And that play prompted a rule change. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. So, I mean... You're doing something right. Again, like, you're right there. But, but I think we all understand that it's just different in Columbus, right? They've won 95 of their last 103 of conference games, mm -hmm. but it's the ones you don't win that people yeah. get worked up about because the expectation is fairly or unfairly to win them all. That's the mental side of this, and I was, I'm, I'm really interested to see how the Buckeyes respond because expectations are a double-edged sword, and we've talked the entire offseason about how this is the most talented roster maybe in this century for Ohio State per Urban Meyer and Jim Tressel. So those are high expectations. They, we were talking as if Ohio State was going to be undefeated, run the table, and win a national title. Now they lost, and as we're sitting here saying, why? It's not talent. Again, it's not resources. It's not, it's not coaching. So they have to overcome that. I'll, I'll, I'll add one more thing to answer your previous question. Tackling. It's fundamentals, right? Oregon tackled much better down the stretch. Quinshawn Judkins, again, didn't break a single tackle on the day. Ohio State's defense, far too many missed tackles, far too many opportunities that they fell short. Dylan Gabriel on the read option. You have a chance to bring him down. He makes a guy miss. Touchdown. Yeah. Okay, so Oregon and Ohio State, Tier 1. Now, we mentioned you had five teams in Tier 2 last time. How Too many. many? How many are in Tier 2 right Too now? Many. Okay, just one. All just right. one, and it's Penn State. And this is, this is I, I, I assume most people see the conference in this light. Could you make the case that Penn State should be in Tier 1? You could, but I'm, I'm just not there yet. It was a great win versus USC. It was a great win for the team, a great win for James Franklin, you know, to go on the road and to close that game out. Phenomenal. But we also have to acknowledge the fact that that's how USC has lost games, too. Penn State did the same thing that Michigan and Minnesota did. They just did it on the road. 
What I'm really excited for for the Nittany Lions, though, is, is Drew Aller. He played some big boy football down the stretch. I understand the three interceptions. Fine. One's a Hail Mary, too, right? Yes, yeah. yes. In the fourth quarter, that final drive to take his team down and, you know, extend this game, fourth and seven, fourth and ten, those were big-time throws that he, we've been waiting to see this from Drew Aller. We know he's a five-star. That, that was a, a, almost like a career-defining opportunity for him that he took full advantage of. And uh, it, I'll, I'll say this, too. Who's their wide receiver one? I don't know that they have one. You know, that's probably, they don't need one with Tyler Warren. And they don't need one because Michigan didn't have one last year either, right? They didn't have a true alpha dog at wide, at, at, outside at the wide receiver position, but they won behind good defense, a run game, and play action with the tight ends. But I, Julian Fleming, I'm sorry, Rick, but Julian well, Fleming showing up on those two fourth yep. down plays where he hadn't caught a pass the whole game. They have again. very capable Absolutely. wide receivers. And, and I think they're deeper at that position than people give them credit for. Are they explosive like Ohio State or like Tez Johnson? No. But they have depth and they have talent and they have the best tight end in the yeah. country in Tyler Warren. I love all the talk that we gave about Colston Loveland, terrific tight end, other good tight ends in this league. Tyler Warren's not just one of the best tight ends in the country. He's one of the best flat-out football players in the nation. I was saying we should, he should be in consideration for the Maxwell Award. Like, Maxwell is best all-around football player. I mean, that guy Heisman Trophy's out to there, be, too, Jake. Yes, seriously. I mean, I'm being dead serious. That was an unbelievable performance, and, and teams know that they're going to Tyler Warren. It just doesn't matter. That guy continues to make plays. It was amazing how well they schemed for him. And we're going to talk about coordinators who have made an impact later in the show. But Andy Kolonicki, I mean, they, they knew what they had. They mentioned this when we were at camp, that they really felt like his versatility was something they hadn't showcased as well as they could. I'd say they're showcasing it now. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So much hype, understandably, about Chip Kelly going to Ohio State as the OC. Mm -hmm. Could you make an argument that Kotelnicki has had a bigger impact in State College so far? I think you could fairly make that argument and have a lot to back it up. We'll see when they play each other. That will decide Very good it. point. Penn State also should be favored pretty much in every game except that Ohio yes. State game, which makes the USC win so big because even if you lose to Ohio State and you don't go to the championship game, you're going to the college yep. football playoff. There's no, no yes. question about it. All right, back to Big Ten today. Rick Pizzo, Dave Revs, and Jake Butt as we continue with Jake's tiers, ranking Big Ten football teams by tiers. To recap, we had Ohio State and Oregon in Tier 1. We had Penn State standing alone in Tier 2. No Indiana. I have a major issue. We'll get to that in just a minute. But you are starting your tier three with an either or. I mean, you want to talk about straddling the fence. <laughs> We're not going with Wasn't it Michigan. supposed to be at this moment? We're not going with Illinois. Yeah, yeah. It is the winner of the Michigan-Illinois game ends up in tier three. I love playing both sides of the fence here. I was going to say, I'm kind of rigging the system, so you I appreciate are. you You're, you're holding putting 12 men on the field here on the Big Ten Today show. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So maybe we have to change the rules uh, for next Thursday's show. Uh, but there's a reason. This, this, this will be an extremely revealing weekend. Uh, and, and this match, it's what makes this matchup so exciting because both these teams, I think about the narratives in this matchup, how desperate Michigan is to kind of steer their ship in the right direction. The same thing for Brett Bielema. They have a real opportunity with their schedule to be a 9 or 10 win team. And I think if, they, if that's the end result at the end of the year, we'll look back at this game and if they do win as the reason why that, they prope that propelled them to that higher height. The, the issue and why, why I'm hesitant on some of these and why I'm saying this weekend's so important, the, the record of Illinois' wins, like, so the, average, their, the total record of their opponents is 11-20 and 20 on the year. We thought that Kansas win was great to start the season. Context and hindsight, maybe not as impressive, right? So I, this, this, that's where I want to see. And, and Illinois, as good as they've been, they've answered some questions. Uh, the offensive line has protected Altmaier. Great. Now we get to see his potential unlocked. They are vulnerable in certain areas, specifically with their run defense. Penn State kind of exploited them. And Penn State, that Penn State game showed why there's a gap in these tiers. Uh, this will be a big weekend for them because we know Michigan's going to come in town and try to run the ball. Yeah, they showed some vulnerability, I would say, in the second half against yeah. Purdue on the defensive end. As it, well. It, it is fair to point out. I mean, I think when you get to Tier 3, and this is where I kind of agree with Rick because I don't think Indiana falls into this category – but we're talking about teams with obvious flaws here. Yes. Like Illinois, are they quite good enough in run defense, defensively in general? I wonder a little bit about them running the ball too, particularly now that they have a really important injury in Caden Fagan. I think Michigan's 
flaws or uh, areas where they could stand to improve have been well documented. They are the least efficient passing team in all of the power conferences. And then the defense, like we've been so fixated on what's going on at quarterback that I think we've kind of ignored what's going on defensively. It it hasn't been great. Okay, yes, that's we knew there'd be a step back at the quarterback position. We understood that. We understood stood the offensive line would regress when you talk about replacing six of your top, top offensive linemen. We knew the passing game would regress. You're replacing your top two wide receivers. We did not know and did not expect the defense to have these type of issues. Their, their pass defense is towards the bottom of the conference and the country. That has ripple effects of their third down defense has been struggling. And what doesn't make sense is... I believe they have three first-rounders on their defensive line. We know Mason Graham and Kenneth Grant. We've been talking about that since spring. But Josiah Stewart has been their best defensive lineman on the season. He's playing like a first-rounder. And then you got Will Johnson, a guy that, in theory, should shut down whoever's wide receiver one every week. But teams have known this. They're getting the ball out quick and have exposed the weaknesses of Uh, Michigan. In theory, in theory, he's supposed to be a first-round pick. He's a very good player. He has not played this year to the level that we have seen him in the past. So one time you decide to go, the winner goes to Tier 3. But you're actually going to double down. Double down. And yes. Kurt Signetti has major issues with this double down. Because uh, he should probably be in <laughs> Tier 2 already. And now you're saying the winner of Indiana and Nebraska is in Tier 3. They're not even in Tier 3 yet. Is yes. that correct? Yes. Well, okay, so if we're going to include Illinois, I, I, you have to include Nebraska because Nebraska – Man, they, they really should have won that I game. I don't have trouble with you, including Nebraska. Yes. I have trouble with you saying Indiana has to win this game to even be in Tier 3. Because Nebraska is by far the best opponent that they've, they've played all year. And from a matchup standpoint, this game will be extremely revealing. I, I look at when I watch Indiana on film offensively, I, I'm, I'm saying, what, what is it that they do well? Like for Ohio State, you got great talent in a creative play caller. Uh, Oregon, it's the quick, efficient passing game with Dylan Gabriel. For Indiana, it's like, what is it? Well, they just do everything really well. There's not one alpha at wide receiver one. Curtis Rourke distributes the ball. They rotate multiple running backs. The offensive line has been efficient. They haven't seen a defensive line like what Nebraska is going to bring with them to town this weekend. Nash Hutmaker, Ty Robinson. I, you're right. They, they, they certainly have a case to be Tier 2. I just feel historically Penn State has earned the right to have a gap. And this weekend will be revealing for Indiana. I want to see what they do against the ferocious defensive front. I mean, I understand what you're saying. I'm kind of with Rick. Like, I, I think we can only go by what they've done. And it's not just that they have won all their games. They've beaten everyone soundly. Like, I again, part of it is just parsing the language. Do you... Are you saying that you definitively believe that this is one of the three or four best teams in the Big Ten? I can understand your hesitation that they will be at that conclusion come the first week of December, although I'm starting to believe they are. But at this moment, I I don't know. I I, I think they've done everything that they can do. I mean, they're second in the nation scoring. They haven't trailed all year. And they gave it away four times, four times in that win over Maryland and didn't give up a single point defensively. Didn't give up a single first down. After those turnovers. Didn't give up a single first down after the four turnovers. And and I I, nuts. Part of it is I'm saying they this Nebraska will be by far their best opponent, but a true story. They've been they've dominated everyone too. So you guys are exactly right. I just for me, Penn State has earned the right to be in that tier by themselves. So maybe it's Indiana in Tier 3 and the others in Tier 4. Like, that's another way to look at it. Indiana's schedule gets demonstrably more difficult yes. starting this weekend. And so we will see. And, again, I think I want to believe that this team is legit. I really think they are. And, again, it depends how you define legit. But, I mean, I think they could be a 10-win team. I, I, I really do. I'm going to have uh, to write Signetti an apology letter now. You, if, might, if they get, yeah. you might. Well, he'll, he'll yeah. use you for going to have to write me an apology letter, too. <laughs> what, what about, I know Wisconsin and Iowa are the two other teams you have an eye on. I mean, Wisconsin, you look at the last two weeks. Yes. They have the largest combined margin of victory of any team in the country. Yeah, over the last 13. Yep. Yeah, pretty yes. good. Yes. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. They have been extremely impressive. And, and, you know, we're calling the game this weekend. So when I asked 
Coach Fickle, like, what's the next level? He's not talking about, like, adding anything. His whole focus is, can they do it three times in a row now? Because mm-hmm. since he came in town, ta- since he came, became the head coach of the Badgers, they haven't had an offensive identity. It's felt like they've been a program in transition now for a year and a half. And then something changed versus Purdue, which they then confirmed versus a good Rutgers team, a team I've been high on, you know, going back to the offseason. Braden Locke's playing great. Their offensive line's been dominant. Tawi Walker. Shoot, nearly 200, y- uh, 200 yards on the ground. The defense has been dominant, but anyone can do it once. A, 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 a little bit less teams can do it twice. If you do it three times, all of a sudden, that is exactly who you are. And then for Iowa, the way they dominated you know, Washington this past weekend, right? Like that's, I, I have to include them in there just because it's Iowa. Like I trust Kirk Ferentz. I just love Caleb Johnson because right now they're saying, Iowa's offense is saying, we're going to run Caleb Johnson 25 times a game. And if you can stop him, great. Every defense knows that. And the guy has nearly a thousand yards midway through the season. And you cannot underestimate the degree to which the offensive line improvement has yes. helped that. Dramatic. Because they had Caleb Johnson a year ago, but they couldn't run him at you in quite the same way. And that, to me, is all about offensive line. And that's been a hallmark of Kirk Ferentz teams for years. And for whatever reason, it fell off here these last few years. And now, look, the pass game still isn't great. I mean, it's a a, a couple of better than Michigan. Diplomatically said. Yeah. It's been better than Michigan's. It has been better than Michigan's incrementally. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, But, again, if you can run teams over and play defense the way they play defense, I'm not sure it matters. It's, it's been pretty cool to watch because totally I think there agree. were so many people yeah. who had dismissed this offense and that Kirk Ferentz was kind of at a point where he was anachronistic offensively. You look at – they got four games of 30 or more points, guys. They had two games of 30 yes. or more points the last two years combined. Break up the Hawkeye offense. It's incredible. It's incredible how much better it is this year. Well, I'm not-